President Joe Biden has warned Israel that the U.S. will stop supplying some weapons if it launches a major ground operation in the Gaza city of Rafah. Referring to 2,000-pound bombs that he paused shipments of last week, Biden acknowledged during an interview with CNN that U.S. weapons had been used by Israel to kill civilians in Gaza. The president's announcement that he was prepared to condition American weaponry on Israel's actions amounts to a turning point in the seven-month conflict between Israel and Hamas. And his acknowledgement that American bombs had been used to kill civilians in Gaza was a stark recognition of the United States' role in the war. The comments amount to be the president's strongest warning yet over a potential ground invasion of Rafa and mark the first time he has said the U.S. could stop shipment of American weapons to Israel. I know that you have paused, Mr. President, shipments of 2,000 pound U.S. bombs to Israel due to concern that they could be used in any offensive on Rafa. Have those bombs, those powerful 2,000 pound bombs, been used to kill civilians in Gaza? Civilians have been killed in Gaza as a consequence of those bombs and other ways in which they go after population centers. And I made it clear <clears throat> that if they go into Rafa, they haven't gone into Rafa yet. If they go into Rafa, I'm not supplying the weapons that have been used historically to deal with Rafa, to deal with the cities, to deal with that problem. We're going to continue to make sure Israel is secure in terms of Iron Dome and their ability to respond to attacks like came out of the, uh, in, uh, out of the Middle East recently. But it's, uh, it's, it's just wrong. We're not, going to we're not going to supply the weapons and the artillery shells used that have been used. Artillery shells as well. Yeah, artillery shells. So just to understand what they're doing right now in Rafa, is that not going into Rafa as, as you define no, they have, it yet? They, have, they haven't gone into the population centers. What they did is right on the border, and it's causing problems with right now in terms of with Egypt, which I've worked very hard to make sure we have a relationship and help. But uh, I've made it clear to Bibi in the War Cabinet, they're not going to get our support if, in fact, they go in these population centers. We're not walking away from Israel's security. We're walking away from Israel's ability to wage war in those areas. So it's not over your red line yet? Not yet, but it's, we've, we've held up the, the weapons. We've, we've held up the one shipment that, as an old shipment that was designed for. We've held that up. Significant uh, shift there from the United States of America, and this is um, dependent on Israel's next move. Your take on this, uh, Rafael? So, significant shift there, but I still think President Biden and Americans on this issue are big hypocrites, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it has been released now. There's a information and intelligence. I was reading the Israeli newspaper, Haaretz, that said that actually, Netanyahu did know that Hamas was going to agree to a ceasefire, but despite that, he said he was still going to hit Rafa. And that's the height of wickedness of Netanyahu. He knew there was going to be some level of contrition on the part of Hamas, agreeing to that ceasefire put together by Qatar. But Haaretz was reporting that he still told people in the cabinet he was going to hit Rafa. Americans pausing arms shipment after they have used billions of American money to kill Gazans, it's still hypocrisy to me. These new shipments are part of the shipments that are going to come in about a 200 pound bomb. As we speak today in this war, Israel spends about $200 million every day. The budget enough alone for this war, uh, based on their military spending, is about $15 billion, which they've upgraded. In fact, if this war spans up to 2024, like Israel is also projecting, I mean, the end of 2024, They've gone to, uh, they're having a budget of about 270 billion, which majority of that is American money and American weapons. America just passed an over 20 billion investment today. I mean, recently to them, which about 17 billion of them was from Amory. So if after killing about 34,000 lives, America now wakes up and stalls armed shipment, which they ought to have done to a recalcitrant Netanyahu, it's the height of hypocrisy. And there's no how you're going to tell me. I think Joe Biden is just doing this, one, 
to be able to look good as elections come forth, because Israel and Gaza is a major issue and it's a dividing factor in the elections. Secondly, those university protests are heightened around the world. And the truth has to be said, because of those heightened protests around the world, you can see that there's a level of contrition on the part of Israelis. Third, there's also an internal fight going on. Israel is highly divided as we speak because there are protests on the streets against Netanyahu and his plots. So, yes, this might probably hold a hand, but I think the ship has bolted already because there's been some strikes on Rafa as we speak. Not of colossal proportion, but there have been some strikes on, on, on Rafa. So when President Biden is saying this, and I'm happy he's acknowledged that there is Gaza blood on America's hands. Because he's out of what was supply was used to kill people. It still goes back to the grand hypocrisy of Americans and their allies and the Israeli in all of this. So it's welcome development, but I don't buy it. Right. They should force Israel to that ceasefire, let them sit on the table and de-escalate. Okay, what led to this moment? <clears throat> Before now, the international community, not just uh, the UK and uh, uh, the United States and European countries have been putting pressure on Israel to agree to a ceasefire, a 40-day ceasefire leading to exchange of uh, hostilities. The international community had also been advising Israel not to engage in violations of humanitarian law so that there will be you know, no uh, direct assault on civilians consistently. Israel had defied everybody. In the middle of this, Anthony Blinken, uh, U.S. Uh, National Security Advisor, had met with Netanyahu. Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary of the U.K., had also made several visits to Israel with uh, Lord Cameron telling him that, look, telling Netanyahu that he should be careful not to violate uh, international humanitarian law. And there have been debates in the UK about whether indeed the legal advice that the British government had received could concretely affirm that uh, you know, Israel is violating international law. The Americans, in the middle of this, approved money for support for Israel, for Ukraine, and all of that. And a lot of people uh, were rattled by that, about what looks like double standards, you know, double speak, hypocrisy on the part of the uh, uh, United States. Now, what is the response of Israel to all of this? Israel has consistently said that the minimum in terms of any ceasefire is to wipe out Gaza. And Benjamin Netanyahu has been very belligerent on that score, even telling the Americans and the British that Israel will make his own choices in terms of what it wants to do. Now, I've made a point on this table that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is also under pressure, heavy pressure for political reasons uh, from the ultra right wing in Israeli politics. Only on Sunday, uh, the National Security Minister of Israel, Ben Givio, was saying that it's only if God allows it that Israel will ever agree to any ceasefire with uh, Hamas. So he's under that pressure, and internally he needs to show uh, you know, members of the coalition uh, that uh, is towing the line. So we, we have an internal problem at that level. Now, this latest response by uh, the United States, by President Biden. The United States is poised to provide about 3,500 munitions, more than half of which will be bombs. And now President Biden says, look, do not go into Rafa. If you go into Rafa, we would uh, be forced not to give you those munitions you are expecting. We are also told that there has been a pause in the supply of uh, arms shipment to uh, Israel. However, why do I say double standard or, or double speak? The same President Biden is telling the world, and that is an interview, televised interview, that the US is, however, still committed to the defense of Israel and that the Iron Dome, Iron Dome project which is used you know, to protect the uh, uh, you know, invasion of Israel through air missiles, will continue, and that the United States will continue uh, to provide resources for that. So on one hand, you say, don't go into Rafa. 
On the other hand, you say we will support the uh, Iron Dome, uh, you know, uh, surveillance uh, system. Now, he was asked the question specifically, does he think Israel has crossed the red line? He said, no, not yet. <laughs> what does he mean by not yet? He says, well, whatever they have done in the last two, three days was at the border, you know, border crossing. But not many people watching developments in that axis in the Middle East will agree with President Biden. Because indeed, the argument, the position of many countries is that indeed Israel has crossed the red line and has violated the rights of uh, non-combatant persons. They are called non-combatant. Persons that, uh, persons, uh, that, that are uh, dohor, that's the technical term, you know, in uh, law of armed com conflict. Persons combat dohor. That's what the, the phrase is. So look at uh, the order that they gave, that about 100,000 people should evacuate from Rafa. Rafa is the last stronghold for the Palestinians uh, in southern Gaza. Over one million population, those people have been put under severe pressure now. So the fear, the concern, the only thing that the Americans can talk about is how to provide, to prevent a humanitarian crisis in the only part of uh, Gaza that is still uh, available. 34,789 uh, 34, Palestinians have lost their lives in the course of this conflict. And Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu and the ultra uh, right wing of Israeli politics still in 60 that they will wipe out Gaza, they are clearly violating international law. And I asked the question, was it yesterday or two days ago, that the question to ask is that, is Israel above international law? Is Israel so powerful that it cannot operate under a rules-based international system, even if that rules-based international system is a, is a, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a word, you know, uh, for a euphemism for Pax Americana? Right, so Rafa is quite significant because it is um, it shares the border crossing with Egypt, and very importantly, it's a major key entry point for aid um, to uh, to to Gaza and the Palestines, and it's also been the only port of um, exit in terms of fleeing um, Palestinians since the beginning of the war seven months ago, and that's why it's quite an, a significant part of this war. In addition to that, he said they are set up be, to be one million civilians living on that strip. And so if there is an attack launched by Israel, then it would clearly be in violation of international laws with regards to war, especially because there would be a lot of civilian casualty. This is something that has now seemed to have pushed the United States to take action and take a definite stance, especially against Israel, in the, as, as it looks like. We've talked about how for many years, and even during this war, the U.S. has stood, uh, stood as a strong ally with Israel. Despite some, you know, pressure on Israel, actually a lot of pressure on Israel to reach a ceasefire deal, a deal with um, the Palestinians, with Gaza. Unfortunately, Israel has continued to be adamant that until they gain victory, they were not willing to open conversations. And in fact, the last deal um, that was reached was said to be not to have met the basic standards of, of their requirement. On Israel's side, what, they, what they're, they're contending is that if they're able to launch an attack successfully on Rafa, it would be a game changer in this war and perhaps would give them victory and give them a foothold when it comes to negotiations in terms of release of hostages. However, would it be worth the civilian casualties that would be, you know, that would be achieved? Now, what the U.S. have done, as we've talked about, is to halt arms shipment to Israel. The U.S. has consistently um, supported Israel in this war by support, um, supply of arms, um, supporting with military uh, artillery. And this time, despite the fact that the Israel Defense Force considers the fact that Israel in itself has enough war chests to go against or to launch an attack against Rafa, it's a symbolic move by America saying, and finally speaking up and saying that they would not stand for a continuous violation, gross violation of human rights if Israel continues to be adamant, despite the fact that international um, partners, inter the international um, world has continuously sought some form of, of truce between Israel and Hamas, especially to end this war. The big question will continue to be, 
Number one, would this move and this announcement by President Joe Biden cause a dent in Israel's campaign to launch attacks in Rafah? Would it cause a dent? Would Netanyahu finally be tamed and listen to pressures or bow to pressure from his international partners, international allies, to finally come to the conversation table to reach a deal and end this war? And number three, would Israel, against all, shun all um, you know, pressures and still go ahead because of this craze to win this war against Hamas and totally annihilate Hamas. Again, it's not yet Uhuru. It's not yet the end of the conversation. There's been a lot of pressure on the United States to speak out and to condemn what's happening in Israel. And now they finally seem to shift, not minding or, of course, in full recognition of the fact that America has an election or Biden has an election to win this year. And this is massively affecting his campaign. But the next few days will let us, I mean, would know if indeed Israel will go ahead despite the lack of support from the United States, one of its strongest allies, especially even in this war. Move on to our next story this morning. The Trade Union Congress has threatened a massive protest if the federal government does not cancel the cybersecurity levy introduced by the Central Bank of Nigeria. A 0.5% deduction of the value of some transactions will be remitted to the National Cybersecurity Fund, which the Office of the National Security Advisor will administer. The TUC says it is prepared to mobilize all its members, stakeholders, and quote the entire, and I quote, the entire masses to embark on an immediate protest that will culminate in the total shutdown of the Nigerian economy, end of quote. The Nigerian Labour Congress has also rejected the levy, calling it anti-people and another burden on Nigerians during a cost of living crisis. Civil rights organization Serap has given President Tinubu 48 hours to withdraw the directive. LCCI equally expressed deep concern that the funds from the charge might not be used to enhance the country's cybersecurity architecture to guarantee cyber safety for technology users in Nigeria. Director General of LCCI, Dr. Chinyere Almona, said in a press release that the justification for the levy was unclear. Almona demanded that it should be withdrawn to allow more consultations with critical stakeholders. All right, so definitely this conversation is not yet over and a number of groups are coming out to express displeasure and asking the federal government to do a U-turn with the cybersecurity levy. Rufai, your take on this story. Like I said yesterday, it doesn't make sense because when you look at it, when you look at the cybersecurity value chain, architectural value chain, it is not the office of the NSA that builds a cybersecurity value chain or architecture. It is the point dispensers. So take, for instance, I register with a payment company to do money transfer. It is that payment company I registered that would bolster their own architecture for me. And there are different touch points, cybersecurity architecture. There are some that pass through a gateway platform like NIPS and the likes. You know, there are some that pass through independent pair to pair, even through a banking system like your OP and the likes. So it is not the office of the NSA. And you see, there's another legal argument to it. The fact that the funding of the office of the NSA is shrouded in a lot of controversy. Also, the NSA itself is a you know, political position. And also, when you look at it very importantly, you would also see that administering the fund is also suspect. This is the same country where we've been levying people all sorts vis-a-vis -vis the cost of living crisis. As we speak, a lot of Nigerians can't live. If the government needs money, they should look for other ideas to be able to bring about money, not taxing the people that are already taxed. Definitely. Only yesterday, Mr. Oyedele has said, okay, let them be a new dimension. Probably we'll increase VAT and be able to stop, you know, remove other taxes from the state government. But when you look at the state government alone, there's so much taxes that not the Nigerians suffer. Only yes, they in Lagos now, they charge VAT, they charge consumption tax. So if you want to have a meal in a restaurant, you pay for VAT, you pay another consumption charge, and there are too many taxes already. And now you want to also bring about a transaction charge that where the money is going to is nebulous, say 40% is going to the NSA as what? Where they are not going to be building a cyber security architecture. So it leaves much to be desired. Right. Okay, we discussed this uh, subject yesterday, so maybe, you know, the reason it's uh, come up again is because of additional reactions. 
if you collate the various reactions. The NLC reacted on May 3 and even sent a letter to the federal government giving an ultimatum that if the federal government does not reverse itself on this issue of cybersecurity level, it will face a general protest. The TUC has also added its voice to the protest, also threatening uh, uh, general strike action, industrial action. Number three, you have the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Number four, you have SERAP, which gave a, a deadline of uh, 48 hours and has threatened to go uh, to court. You have, uh, you have uh, Mr. Peter Obi, uh, who has also uh, spoken up. You have various other commentators who have spoken on this issue. If you summarize what you know, people are saying, number one is that the average Nigerian is already overtaxed. What are some of the taxes that uh, the Tinubu administration has introduced? First, removal of uh, fuel subsidy, right? Under this administration also, you have had all kinds of other taxes uh, removed. For example, telcos are saying that they will, uh, they will increase uh, you know, call rates. That is on the table. Um, providers of uh, you know, uh, cable television services have also said that their rates will go up. Inflation is... Uh, at over 32%. Food, food inflation is higher. And then the question that people ask is that in terms of timing, in terms of the very logic of it, this is like imposing more hardship on a Nigerian that is already overburdened. And as if to add salt to the wound. Taiwo Yedele came up yesterday, although what Taiwo Yedele's committee on tax policy has uh, come up with is a proposal, is a recommendation. That is not yet government policy. It's for government to take a look at it. If his committee says we are going to increase uh, VAT, it's a matter of law. Uh, that will require, you know, amendment of enabling laws and all of that. So let's just take what Taiwo Yedele's committee said as a suggestion which has to be debated. But that's also a suggestion that in fact, our woes are not yet over. Now to go back to the cybersecurity level, the other issues apart from hardship and timing is that, look, government says this is a, a, a based on law, section 44, sub uh, two of uh, the Cyber Crime uh, Prohibition and Prevention Act of 2024. And people are saying, well, this law, when was it passed? Why would the National Assembly allow that kind of law uh, to be passed? And that in any case, why would the uh, uh, NSA's office collect 40% out of over 2 trillion that will be collected? Which uh, cyber security uh, purpose is being served? Is it the man whose money is, uh, with, uh, is taken? Is it the ordinary man or cyber security is for some other targets. Questions have also been raised. Why is it not the banks paying? These banks come every, every quarter. They give us humongous uh, reports. So why, why is it not the banks even paying that cyber security level and not the ordinary man? The danger is that the cost of uh, uh, business for SMEs and all of those people who do transactions will be affected. Greater hardship will be imposed on their business. Beyond that also, you may find people now not engaging in uh, cash transfers, digital payments. And look, one of the objectives of government had been to uh, promote financial inclusion, uh, improve, uh, improve upon uh, digital payments. Okay, who wants to do transfer if they are going to take an additional 0.5% from your money in addition to administrative charges, in addition to uh, 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 you know, stamp duty and all kinds of charges. So who, came up with the idea of a cashless economy. And then, and then why are you introducing policies that defeat that uh, policy? The uh, general recommendation by everyone who has commented on this, with the exception, with the notable exception of uh, uh, pro-government uh, spokespersons, you know, uh, saying it's for our benefit and all that. But I've seen just about two persons 
saying it's for our benefit. The other Nigerians are saying, we don't understand this policy. The recommendation is that government should take another look, even at the section 40, 44 sub 2 of the uh, uh, Cybercrime Act that is being quoted, and that the National Assembly has the responsibility in this regard. So these are the issues. If you bring the topic again tomorrow, we will discuss it and state the same issues. Absolutely. And, and the reason why this must be on the front burner is that we cannot just talk until there's action. So um, we haven't heard anything in terms of reversal or rethinking of this um, policy or the circular by the CBN. And so we we'll continue to speak about this until at least some form of action so that we do not continue to overburden the already burdened Nigerian people with more taxes and taxes and taxes. The only thing I'd like to say on this one is what Mr. Festus Osifo talked about um, in terms of the TUC's response, where he talked about the complicity of our legislators in even constructing a law like this and passing it. I say this because yesterday when we had Mr. Adebajo, he had, and rightly said, talked about the fact that, well, they had a public hearing, they were, it went through the first and second reading, the law was passed, it was signed, and we didn't raise, um, there, was no, there were no uproars at the time. But the first thing we must remember is that the people who sit in the House, uh, in, in, in the House of Assembly, uh, National Assembly, are there to represent the best interest of the people. And so when there are anti-people laws like this being made, then you wonder what indeed, whose interest they are serving in the National Assembly. Because at the end of the day, the reason why we expect them to think well for the people, because they are there representing, they are there on the mandate of the people. And so they looked at everything that Nigerians are going through, and they felt that the next most important law to pass is the amendment, which it was done in good faith, I must say, but to then burden Nigerians with the tax of paying for it, I thought that was a very ill-conceived um, um, law in terms of um, passing legislature. And I think they also must answer questions in terms of this, you know, what we're raising. Can we not trust legislators anymore to represent the interest, the best interest of the Nigerian people?